Hello, I'm Dr. Peg here at Elisha's home on Freedom Mountain, and I want to welcome you to another week in our series of studying the Psalms. I want to encourage you to find a comfy spot and uh, find your notebook and a good pen that's not going to run out in the middle of the lesson, and uh, just to come and gather uh, for some word some encouragement. Today we're going to take a look at Psalms chapter 41. If you want to go ahead and open the word, um, then it'll be it'll be open and ready when it's time. I hope that you've had a good week. Hope that you've stayed safe on the ice and that you are looking to the future which holds a beautiful spring, right? So I noticed that some of the geese have come back and I see little squirrels are out and about running and uh, looking for the rest of their nuts that they've stored up for the rest of the winter. And the deer are rummaging for something good to eat. And so I'm sure they are hoping that spring is just around the corner when the grass will be nice and bright and green and super, super sweet like candy. So let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you uh, for the Psalms that David so faithfully wrote, um, not just when he was uh, in a good season, but he wrote some when he was in a not so good season, like Psalms 41 that we're going to read today. And so Heavenly Father, I ask that you open our spiritual eyes, and that you open our spiritual ears, and that our spirits would be receptive, and that we would embrace the truths that you have for us today and that our lives will be impacted and changed forevermore. Heavenly Father, we welcome the Holy Spirit here today. We give you full reign and uh, we look forward to the rhema word that you have for us today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So looking today at Psalms 41, we see that this is a psalm that uh, rises up and asks God for his compassion. So as we go through this psalm, we're going to see that David is in a period of uh, desperate sickness. He's in a season where uh, his supposed friends are whispering behind his back and deflaming his character. And so who needs friends like that anyway, right? Have you ever had a friend that uh, you share something and within 15 minutes it comes back to you through two to three other people and it's not even factual? That's a little disturbing. Truth be told, that's not a friend. So you might stop and think about that today. Who are your true friends? And then who present as a friend but not really? So we're going to take a look now at verse 1 through 3. We see uh, here he speaks of the blessings that belong to the one who considers the poor. This is what he says. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he will be blessed on the earth. You will not... Deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. Let's just pull back for just a moment. Take some time to ponder on those three scriptures. Now, blessed is he who considers the poor. Now, we know historically that King David did consider the poor. So when we say consider, does that mean that, you know, as he's driving his chariot down the road and he sees poor people out gathering and gleaning from fields, does that mean that he just says, ah, yep, there's some poor people and he keeps on going? Or does that mean that he takes note that in this particular district, I see many poor people and then goes back to his palace, his office, and begins to reflect from what he saw, and then begins to ask God, what could I do to make the world a different place for those poor people? 
So when you consider the poor, it doesn't mean that you just put pity on them and say, ah, oh, poor things. It means that when you notice that they're in need, that you allow God to be, you allow God to be, meaning that your hands and your feet are going to do what? You're going to reach out. You're going to reach out to the poor. And then notice that uh, as we look at these three verses, it's almost as though David is trying to um, remind himself of who the Lord is, who the Lord's been in his past, so that he can boost his faith to believe for who God is yesterday, but who he is today. And of course, we know he'll be tomorrow. So he says, notice, he says, you will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. So, is he just reminding himself, or is he reminding God also? In the past, I saw you do this, and then he says, you will sustain him on a sickbed. So, he has seen that, or experienced that. He's reminding God, but he's also reminding himself. This is what you did in the past. So, because you are a never-changing God, if you did that yesterday, you'll do that for me today. And you'll do that for me tomorrow. So in our changing world, I think one of the key things that we have to remember is that we serve a God that is never changing. So as discouraged as you might be, go back, say to yourself, okay, what did God do for me before? What did I see him do for others in the past? So what does that mean for today? The present. He did all of those wonderful things in the past, he will do all those wonderful things today and in your future. So notice that he is speaking about those who consider the poor. As we go further into this psalm, we're going to see that he reminds God that he is one of those people. So when we think about economic poverty, we're not just thinking of the economic dollar but typically, we get the vision in our mind of a weakness or a helplessness. And so many people that have ever had a season where maybe they've not been um, prosperous, they will share with you that, you know, there is this certain feeling that you just keep treading and treading and treading and you don't see a breakthrough. And so that can be very discouraging. And so... Uh, David is thinking about the person who is a righteous person. A righteous person will not pass by a poor person without extending their hand to help. To help. So it's not about extending your hand so that everyone can see, but extending your hand in private. Did I just say that? Yeah, I did. How many of you know someone who loves to help the poor, but they love to tell the whole world and they make sure that everyone is watching or they make sure that the person who's going to tell this person, tell this person, tell this person, tell this person sees them do it rather than doing it in secret, in secret. So this particular act of reaching out to the poor, David reminds us, is a significant mark of a righteous and godly person. Spurgeon said this, The poor intended are such as are poor in substance, weak in bodily strength, despised in repute, and desponding in spirit. These are mostly avoided and frequently scorned. So let me just ask you this. You know, when you get into a situation and there are numerous poor people around you, what is the first thing that you think of? And I'm not even going to say what some of you think. 
But what's the first thing that you think of? Do you look at their situation? And then do you say to yourself, God, how can I help these people? What do I have that I could give them? What do I have that if I gave to them, they could take that and multiply? So we're not saying that, you know, every day you're going to show up and give them fish to eat. But what we are saying is that for a couple or several days, you're going to show up and you're going to teach them how to fish. There's a big difference. When you consider the poor, do you want them to stay like that forever? Are you going to be here forever to take them a fish every day? Or are you going to multiply your time and the blessings that you can offer by teaching them how to fish? If you teach them how to fish, then what? You teach them how to sustain their own needs. And then they become independent. They're no longer reliant. Remember, we're not to be reliant on anyone but God. So the only way that you can help the poor by not making them reliant on you is by giving so that they can multiply based on what you gave. So if that means that you are a person who has a trade and you come across a poor person, you might hire them for a period, teach them some skills, and then they can continue to remain using those skills or they might go out and start their own business. So multiplicity is the key to the poor, helping them to sustain and become reliant on God and on the skills that God brings forth through others reaching out. So consideration, it means that you, you look, you see the situation, you go into the prayer closet, you ask God, what can I do? What is the most important thing for me to do at this moment to get that person to the next step, to becoming independent and moving on and being prosperous and self-sustaining with your direct strength? Those who consider the poor are those who give from their own resources. Right? So it's not the person who says, oh, well, you know, if you go five blocks, um, they have food. When you sit with a kitchen filled, your cupboards are filled with food. Or the righteous would be a person who considers the poor and is kind to them in their need, edifies them, builds them up. Let's them know this is just a, a season. It's just a season. You will get through this season and extend a hand of help. So one who considers the poor helps those who likely will not help him in return. So this speaks to the motivation of your heart. When you extend your hand to help, What's in your mind? What's in your heart? Why? Why are you helping? Are you helping so the whole world sees? Are you helping because you know that you know that if you help this person in this way, that it's going to multiply to put them in a better place? Motivation of the heart. That is key. So one who considers the poor typically will have a generous heart. They would give you the shirt off of their back. Why? Because they have the love of Christ. And then, because they have the love of Christ, their love covers, and they're not uh, out there with a megaphone saying, guess who I saw today? Guess who I helped today? Guess what I gave them? Guess what I did? And then say it 55,000 times so the whole world hears. That's a motivation of the heart issue. That is a... A serious issue. So those who consider the poor give for 
that individual's good and not simply to make oneself feel good. It is satisfying to know that if you extend your hand as God directs, that you can make a change in someone's life and it can be a U-turn and they can come out of that desperate season that they're in. That is a good feeling. However, that is not the key to giving and considering the poor or those who are in need. It is to pull them up and put them on a place where God can continue to bless them and they themselves can become prosperous because you reached out, you gave them a skill, or you gave something that would multiply beneficially for their sustenance. So considerance, you know, we talk about considering the poor, it's giving careful thought to the person's situation rather than just giving perfunctory help. So when you consider, that means that you go to the prayer closet, you walk around, you walk around their situation in the prayer room, and you wait for God to show you, to give you perspective of where that person is, what they have, what they need, and what is up ahead. And oftentimes, he will tell you, I need you to go do this, or I need you to go do this, or I need you to go uh, bring this to the attention of this person who may have what they need when you don't have what they may need. All right, so you reach out. So, you know, oftentimes we see people doing charity work. And as they're doing charity work, motivation of the heart can be seen. Have you ever noticed sometimes that you have a person who has oodles of wealth? And so... Maybe at Christmas time when the Salvation Army is out and the bell is a-going and they're trying to bring attention to the fact that there are needy individuals in our community who would not have a Christmas. And have you ever seen where there would be maybe a very wealthy person that would put change to empty out and clean out a pocket? Change. And then, a few minutes later, have you ever noticed that there might be an individual that is very obvious that they are in need themselves and you will see them put dollars into that red canister? Hmm. Makes you stop and think about the motivation of heart. So... We don't want to be one of those people that just throws money at people because, oh, I threw money at you so I don't need to go to the prayer closet and ask God for the consideration of what it is that I am to do. If I throw money at it, ooh, it goes through my brain, it's gone, I forget it, I don't need to pray for you, I don't need to care about you, I did my little momentary thing. Really, that's kind of sad, kind of sad. Now notice, he says the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. And so we see in Deuteronomy 28 that this would be a chapter of scripture that David was very familiar with and that if you walked in the covenant, you walked in blessings for your obedience and there were curses for your disobedience. So this is something that... Um, you know, you can see that being a person that is generous, there are numerous blessings uh, that are part of that package that are consequences for your heartfelt motivation to consider the poor. So as we move on, we see that he reminds us that that particular righteous person is blessed on earth. And so this, again, is an indication that he's referring back to the Old Covenant where we see that 
physical blessings were here on earth as they are also in eternal life. So notice he reminds himself and he reminds God when he says you will sustain him on a sick bed. So most commentators believe that when this particular psalm was written that David was very, very sick. When we look at verse 5, we're going to see that he maybe was in danger of death. And so David was reaching out to God and trusting that God would bless him from his prior goodness to the weak and the needy. Let's take a look now at verse 4 to 6 and we see that this is his plea for mercy against the evil speaking traitors. So I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. And so he is trying to appeal to God on the merit of his own good works. And he specifically brings before the Lord his consideration of the poor. And so in light of this relative righteousness, according to the old covenant, uh, this was something that he could come to the Lord, to the mercy seat, and he could ask for God's blessing. So then he continues heal my soul for i have sinned against you so he knew that he had done much that was good in the eyes of the lord but he also knew that because the goodness didn't erase his sins and that he also stated and knew that his sins were directed against god and that those sins made him sick in the sense in a soul and he needed healing and so his soul sickness was more important than his physical sickness so let me just say this oftentimes we'll see people that have a soul sickness and that magnifies their physical sickness why because their outlook, their outlook is not reliant on scripture. Their outlook is reliant on the strength they have in themselves. And you all know when you get sick, you need the strength of the Lord to make it through. And so we're going to take a moment. If you have your notebook, this will be something that you might want to write down just to reflect on this week. Um, we can identify at least three ways that David said he needed healing for his soul. He said, heal my soul from its great distress. So was he stressed out? Yeah, he was stressed out. We all know that when we have stress, that it produces uh, a chemical in the brain called cortisol. And we know that um, there's a multiplicity that is humongous in seeing that cortisol is resolved in our system so stress can do some pretty horrific things within our bodies he says heal my soul of the effect of sin so he's not denying that he has sinned and then he says heal my soul of my tendency to sin and so he's making a plain and a heartfelt honest confession of his sins when he says I have sinned against you so this is a confession without 101 excuses have you ever had someone come to you and say I'm sorry that I said yada 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 but well that's a really big but so everything that you just said that you were sorry you just canceled out so that is not an apology it's not a confession. You're just taking up air. 
just taking up air. So really think about that. You know, when you go to speak to someone about something that you have done or that you have said, simply state the fact, I said this, I did this, I was wrong, please forgive me. And then clamp it down, don't say any more. And don't sit there and qualify why you did what you did. And certainly do not approach the throne of grace with a superficial humbleness. So we see in the scriptures that Saul and Judas each said, I have sinned. But notice that David says, I have sinned against thee. So there's something about that admittance of his sin. It wasn't just, yeah, I sinned. It was, I recognize that I sinned against God. Note that he makes mention, my enemies speak evil of me. So he knew what it was like to be hurt and the difficulty of how evil spreads lies about people and the pain that's covered by that. So he had to find it within himself to rely on God's strength to endure this season of outrageous slander and defamation of his character. All right. And, you know, we started off by speaking to the sin of gossip and how, you know, you can think that you have a friend and then within 15 minutes, whatever you shared that was to be confident in confidence with that friend comes back in 15 minutes through three to four other people and it's not even the straight scoop. So then you have to say to yourself, is that person really a friend? Something to ponder. So in early Christianity, we see that uh, there were many Christians that were persecuted during David's time and we're going to take a look for just a moment at some reasons why the people in the Roman Empire thought that Christians were worthy of persecution, right? So in that time era, they accused Christians of hostility to the emperors and conspiracy against the state. They accused Christians of incest, of cannibalism, of being atheist, of being haters of humanity and they accused Christians of being the reason why problems plagued the empire. Now there's a few of those that are consistent with our time. Just a few, right? So the enemies of early Christianity, they spoke evil of the followers of Jesus and they spoke lies. So we know that Christians were good citizens and they prayed for the emperor. We know that Christians then lived pure moral lives. We know that Christians never practiced anything like cannibalism. We know that Christians were not atheists and we know that Christians loved others and showed Christ's love all the time. And we know that Christians made the empire better, not worse. So, take a few minutes to think about that this week uh, as to the last two years in our very own country, some of the political things that we see that have been going on and some of the things that have been said of Christianity. Amazing sometimes. So, then he goes on to say, when will he die and his name perish? They couldn't wait for David to die. Now, is that is that a Christian? And so they did whatever they could do to bring his death to pass. Remember how we've always talked about words and how powerful words are? Well, it doesn't matter if it's words that are good words 
are bad words. In fact, you will find that if you say something bad about someone, it will come back to you like a boomerang within 30 minutes, depending on what crowd you're in. But if you say something good about someone, it might never come back to you. In fact, it might never come back to that person. So, you know what I would, uh, I would just say this. Could I convince you that when you hear something good said about someone, that you would pick that up and that you would carry it to the person that the good was said about? Why? Because it will edify that person. It will let them know that, you know what, somebody, somebody saw something that you did, even though you probably didn't do it for them to see, but somebody saw that you did something good because they're never going to hear that now the bad anytime they screwed up they're going to hear about that they're going to be people coming and telling them over and over and over but the good that they do they're not going to hear about that so let's determine to be that person that would carry the good back and do it in a timely fashion do it in a timely fashion so that as that person might be torn down by slander and gossip, might you be the person that carries back that beautiful diamond of edification, of edification. So let's take a look now at verse 7 through 9. And here we see the whispers and the betrayal. So I want you to stop and think about this. You know how we've brought up about how you can share something private and then it comes back to you like a boomerang? You know, that is a form of gossip. And each of the people who took place, took part in that, are just as guilty as the first person who dished it out. And then, that is betrayal. And so if you've never studied out the word betrayal in the scriptures, that is an awesome study, one that it would behoove you to study that particular word study in the scriptures. And so this is what David said, all who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. In other words, has kicked me to the curb, has spoken negativity. So let me just say this to you. Has there ever been a time that there's been a prayer request brought to you? And in the natural, in the natural, you knew what the medical people were saying in the natural. And so instead of transferring from the natural into the spiritual, you stayed stuck in the natural. And then you began speaking, oh, that person's going to die. That person's going to die. Instead of, you shall live and not die. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of Christ. Now, don't sit there and say that you've never done that. Don't become a liar on top of the list that might be there already. So, here's what he says. All who hate me whisper together against me. So, this isn't just one person. This is several. And so, then... They're whispering conspiracies. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about a conspiracy, I think of uh, deranged people. People who, for the life of them, can't uh, center their intellect to think logically. And so the more that this conspiracy is spun... And the people that are involved, the more it spins, the more off balance they become, the more drastic are the things that they say 
against the individual that is the brunt of their attack. So then in the same uh, scriptures, he says an evil disease clings to him. So this may be true. This may be true that it was an uh, evil disease. Um, you know, we can see in Psalms 38, 3, and then Psalms 38, 6 through 8, that sometimes there were diseases that, mm -hmm. so that would be something that you need to study out. We don't have enough time to even begin to approach that, but there are, there are diseases that are categorical in the spiritual and that would be something that if you've never studied would be an awesome study to begin to have. Uh, so notice that there's a condemning that's going on towards David. Not only is he on a sick bed, his deathbed possibly, and here they are, instead of lifting him up to the throne of grace, they are throwing arrows, death arrows, by their words. So notice that the evil disease the word more commonly used in the scriptures is vile, which is a translation from Belial, and it can be translated as a sickness from the devil, an accursed disease, or an assigned, an assigned disease from Satan, from Satan. And so... Here he goes on and he says, Even my own familiar friend that I trusted, who's eaten and broken bread with me, kicked me to the curb. Now, I just summarized it. You know that, right? So his woe was bitter because this was a person that he trusted. This was a close friend. And so it was a familiar friend. And so this was an even deeper wound. And it was a wound of betrayal betrayal notice it was the opposite of loyalty so if you're a person that walks in loyalty love covers and that means that poison is not going to be spewing out of your mouth right we notice in second samuel chapter 15 that david was betrayed even by his own son absalom and in second samuel chapter 15 verse 12 and then verse 31, we see that he was betrayed by a trusted advisor. And so this was a treacherous friend. Friend. So who needs a friend like that, right? Who needs a friend like that? So we want to take notice that uh, in... Um, Verse 10 through 12, we see that David is praying for mercy from God and that he would triumph over his enemies. Looking at verse 10, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. And so he's not only praying for forgiveness and deliverance, but he's praying to triumph over his enemies. And as one of the Lord's anointed, he feels that he is justifying and requesting this and looking forward to God's deliverance as evidence that God is well pleased with him. He says, you uphold me in my integrity. So he felt that in contrast to his enemies, he was a man of integrity and he needed to rely on God's strength to uphold him. And then he says, and set me before your face forever. So this was an important thing to David, more important than triumphing over his enemies was to be set before the face of God to enjoy the Lord's favor and his fellowship. Now, notice this particular psalm ends with praise in verse 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And so, 
some believe that this was not actually the end of this psalm, um, but they say to look to the first book of the psalms, and here we find that Yahweh is honored as the covenant God, and so it is fitting for David to end the song with his eyes on the Lord, not upon himself or upon his enemies or upon his situation. And so we see that there are five books that are presented in the Psalms. Book one is Psalm 1 through 41. There are 41 Psalms in that first book of the Psalms. Then book two of the Psalms we see starts with Psalms 42 to book, I'm sorry, Psalm 40, 42 to 72. And we see that there are 31 Psalms. And then the third book of the Psalms we see starts in uh, Psalm 73 and goes to Psalm 89. In this portion of this book, the third book, there are 17 Psalms. And then in the fourth book we see starts with Psalms chapter 90 to 106. Again, there are 17 Psalms. And then the last book of the Psalms, book five, begins with Psalms 107 to 150. And in that final book of the Psalms, there's 44 Psalms. So we notice when we study each of those five books, they begin with an outburst of praise and they are cinched with an amen and amen, all right? Or a hallelujah, meaning praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Notice from everlasting to everlasting. And what does that mean? When you hear people say from everlasting to everlasting, it means that the Lord's gonna be praised to the eternal God, sketching from eternity past to eternity future. And the word everlasting in the Hebrew means vanishing point. And so remember the words of Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the thoughts uh, that you have dropped in our spirit uh, to ponder this week. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, our time with you has been sweet fellowship. We look forward to further studying this particular psalm and uh, coming into our prayer room this week to quietly enter and to consider to consider the poor as a righteous person and to have reflection in the spirit and then to be your hands and your feet to make an impact to be a world changer for the kingdom of God Heavenly Father we thank you for your daily provisions we thank you for your thumbprint that's on our lives and Lord, we give all credit which is due unto you. We give you glory and we give you honor. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a good study. I'm looking forward to next week. And I hope that you are also enjoy your time with the Lord this week. And again, I'll see you next week.